It's an understatement to say that these are tumultuous political times that we live in. On December 10th, 2015, I donned a hijab in solidarity with my Muslim sisters. That course radically altered the state of my life, but more importantly, it altered the state of public conversation surrounding religion in the United States, but also around the, the conversation surrounding whether or not we have unity across our differences. And this unity I would like to talk to you about today as the form of embodied solidarity. An embodied solidarity costs, but embodied solidarity is worth the cost. I learned the most prescient and poignant lessons about embodied solidarity during my time in Rwanda in 2014. Rwanda, the Valley of Dry Bones. Rwanda, 20 years post-genocide. In 2014, when I visited Rwanda, I was devastated. Devastated by the dry bones. The prophet, the prophet Ezekiel asks, can dry bones, God asked the prophet Ezekiel, can dry bones live? And Ezekiel says, God, you know. Rwanda beckons to us to ask the question, can dry bones live? In Rwanda, I was devastated, as one's heart should be, by caskets that are actually shelves, shelves as in an archaeologist lab, full of bones, skulls with pickaxes protruding from them, femurs with stripes of machete marks. But that wasn't the most devastating. The most devastating thing that I saw in Rwanda was the apparition of blood and brain matter from a baby's skull being crushed against the brick wall of a church for being born Tutsi. What Rwanda begs us to ask is the question of this, do bodies matter? Because if babies' bodies don't matter, human rights are superfluous. Constitutional declarations and UN machinations don't mean a damn thing if we don't see that babies' bodies matter. So the question that Rwanda beckons us to ask is do we see people or do we see zombies? Do we see humans? Humans, not just people, but humans of bone and marrow. Marrow is the stuff of life. And what Rwanda says to me is we failed to ask the question. We failed to see the writing on the wall, the baby's blood. And what this beckons us to do is to live our lives in a more embodied fashion. If you think, though, that Rwanda is Rwanda because it didn't have a rubric of human rights, think again. Because before Americans get on their human rights high horse, we need to remember where we were during the genocide. Republican Congress of the Contract with America, Democratic President Clinton. I was a college student at Rice University, sitting in all places in an East African history class, worried more about what I would wear on Easter morning when the genocide began than about the oppression of human bodies. I made peace with oppression. We make peace with oppression. Clean American hands is an oxymoron. We are all guilty of genocide. Because we see zombies. Now, the zombie genre is one of my favorites. My family has this ongoing you know, debate about who they would choose to be on their team in the zombie apocalypse. I'll leave you to wonder whether I make people's team or not. Um, but zombie genre means that um, it really is a statement and a reflection of where we are in human society. Um, zombies, once like us, are infected. Now they're lunging for it, forward towards you, hell-bent on your destruction and their survival. That's the zombie political economy. Zombies have a market preference, it's you. <laughs> and 
Zombies themselves uh, are really rational actors. They want your pretty uninfected face. They'll do anything to get it. And actually, you too have a market preference, which is to survive. So what's the solution? Kill the zombies. In the US, we have a zombie political economy as well. I live in Chicago, where children on the south and west sides of the city walk through the portals of their future, public schools, every day into institutions that are actually socializing them and assimilating them into a life called prison, mass incarceration. Because in Chicago, counselors call the police on six-year-olds and get them initiated into the criminal justice system young. Because these portals that they walk through as they walk to school, ironically, through a program called Safe Passage, when they get to school, guess who's there to greet them? Guards, chains, fences, gates. That's the American dream for black kids on the south and west sides of Chicago. Eight-year-old zombies. So, if you're not convinced or moved by the black zombies, the black baby zombies, perhaps you can be moved by the fact that we also have religious zombies. The, the political zombie du jour are Muslims. In November of 2015, the president of a bona fide Christian college in the United States, Liberty University, in case you don't know, Lynchburg, Virginia, that name means something, actually said in chapel service, for those who are non-religious, that's church, y'all, <laughs> said to his students that if more good, God-fearing Christians were carrying guns, San Bernardino wouldn't have happened. So he told his students to, quote, end those Muslims. And he mentioned, by the way, we offer gun courses on campus. This is the state of our political rhetoric, but also the kind of political rhetoric that adheres in religious institutions who first and foremost are supposed to have a robust concept of human dignity and human flourishing. But we see zombies, Muslim zombies. What are the consequences of our zombie politics? Black boys are zombified, and we grant political institutions the authority to demolish their bodies. Police deputize to see black boy zombies shoot 16 times first, cover it up, and are pretty damn sure that no one will ask questions later, unless the Oracle YouTube prophesies the truth. We see zombies we have a human dignity problem. So how do we bring back the bodies? Embodied solidarity. This is a picture, a picture from the West Bank, the wall. This is a picture that some of my former students, um, well, they painted the wall illegally, um, on their spring break recently, lots of people do, to embody solidarity. This is a great place to think about embodied solidarity, this particular point, because I would submit to you that you can't be pro-Israeli without being pro-Palestinian, because Palestinian bodies matter. Because you can't go to the Church of the Nativity and see the place where baby Jesus was born in Palestine and forget that Jesus came to suffer with and for the oppressed, to walk with them in their valley of, of the shadow of death on the way to his own valley of suffering. So we have a human dignity problem. People in religious communities who are supposed to, of all people, be gripped by the beauty of the creation of bodies in the image of the divine. So how do we bring back the bodies? Embodied solidarity. Embodied solidarity simply means this. 
suffering with. But suffering with requires our entire bodies. Solidarity from a distance is not solidarity. Theoretical solidarity is not solidarity at all. Embodied solidarity means, number one, a paradigm shift. Since we see zombies, we need to change our zombie vision glasses to see with the eyes of our heart. The eyes of the heart that say, people matter because humans matter because we find ourselves in others. Because in the words of an African proverb, Ubuntu, I am because we are. So human bodies matter. We need a paradigm shift. We need to be convinced of the reality that we see zombies. And we need to recapture our moral and political imaginations and recover a robust concept of human dignity, not human rights. Human dignity. Human rights are superfluous without a robust concept of human dignity. So our paradigm needs to shift. Secondly, our position needs to change. So embodied solidarity asks these questions. Number one, whom do you see? Number two, where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself in privileged perches, like ivory towers where professors like me sit? and peer across the ocean at genocide in Rwanda and fail to do anything about it. Oh, yes, we make up new terms for genocides and holocausts, like mass incarceration. That's what professors do from their perches in their ivory towers. So where do you find yourself? The greatest political and social movement leaders of our history were so because they positioned themselves in the midst of oppression. King in Selma, Gandhi's Salt March, Mandela in South Africa, Jesus in Samaria. Jesus didn't stumble upon lepers. He went where lepers live, leper colonies. In order to see bodies suffering, we have to place ourselves in the midst of oppression. So where do you find yourself? We need to change our posture. What is our posture towards the suffering? Our posture towards the oppressed. Americans like to fix things, in case you haven't noticed. We're the country of invention. We're the country that doesn't take a vacation because we want to outdo the world in not resting. So we need to change our posture. Because when we come to places of oppression and suffering, guess what we try to do? We try to guess the causes of multi-layered, multiplicative oppression in a double helix of suffering. And then we try to make one-size-fits-all prepackaged solutions to complicated problems. We need to change our posture. We need to come with empty hands and open eyes and ears and hearts, hearts willing to be devastated by the reality of the baby's blood on the wall because what embodied solidarity requires is admitting that we don't know what we don't know. Embodied solidarity requires us not explaining away someone else's experience of suffering. So we need to change our posture. Finally, embodied solidarity requires us to change our perspective. Our perspective. Our perspective privileges the powerful who aren't doing a damn thing to change the inequality. Instead, they instantiate the FTC and the World Bank in neoliberal ways that reproduce structural inequality, and then we throw our hands up. But we create inequalities because we don't privilege the perspective of the oppressed. The oppressed don't need us to solve their problems. They need their voices amplified because they've been deprived of political voice and political agency because we've, we've zombified them, which means they're no longer citizens. So we need to privilege their perspective. So I mentioned that I would tell you about Rwanda. And the question is, can dry bones live? This is Rwanda in 2014. On the left is Jean Vier. 
Jean Vier's eyes I will never forget. Those eyes that once killed indiscriminately. Those blood-soaked orbs, now piercing in forgiveness and radical forgiveness. He, Jean Vier, the chief perpetrator of genocide, has become the chief reconciler. The picture to the left, to the right, excuse me, is a group of perpetrators and victims of genocide who meet together in radical community, exercising radical forgiveness. And Jean Vier is Jesus, the chief reconciler who his enemies chose to be his friend. This woman was walking down a hill one day when she saw across the way the man who left her for dead on the first day of the genocide. As they approached, he turned his face away. And she said, do you know me? He said, I don't know you. And she said, sure you do. You left me for dead. You speared me here and here. And she said, next time you see me, look at me. She said, I am your mother. She dignified him. So the pox on all of our houses, out damned spot, she said to him, your bloody hands matter because you matter. She freed him from the shame and stigma of being a genocidaire because she dared to dignify his humanity because she saw him with the eyes of her heart, not with the eyes of human rights. Cows for Peace is the culmination of this program. Cows for Peace, the group that you saw sitting under the tree in the last slide, actually is a program where a victim of genocide, Augustine here, all 11 of, 11 of his siblings were killed in the genocide. The only surviving family member is one nephew. He was gifted a cow, and the person who killed his family raises the cow with him. In Rwanda, there's a proverb that says, to give a cow is to give life. When the, ca the first calf was born, and the calf you see there, it was gifted by Augustine to the perpetrator of genocide, the one who killed his family. And now they raise that cow together. This is Rwanda, 22 years post-genocide. Not the face of human depravity, but the face of human dignity. And what we should learn from this miraculous genocide is that embodied solidarity matters. It matters more than being right. Forgiveness matters more than human rights. Human dignity is paramount. Dry bones can live after all. Thank you.